Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meanahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, today we're going to take a look at Broom Service from Ravensburger. This is one of the Spiel des Jahres nominees, specifically the Kenner Spiel des Jahres nominees, an award that is given out uh, in Germany each year to a game. It's not, it's not that old. It's only a few years old, the award. Um, but it's a game that is a little bit heavier than the actual Spiel des Jahres. Spiel des Jahres is a family weight game. This one's Games that are nominated for the Kenner Spiel are supposed to have a little more bite to them, a little more strategic. Um, Brew Service is actually a re-implementation of a game called Witch's Brew, I believe. I have not played that. I don't know anything about the original version, so I cannot comment on that as we go through the rest of this review. I apologize. Um, although, from what I understand, from what I have heard, this is a very different re-implementation of that. It's not just a pasted on a makeover of it. Now, well, the theme of the game is that you're taking control of a bunch of witches and you're going across the countryside in this fantasy realm trying to make deliveries. You're pick up and delivery. You're dropping off potions, trying to get points, but there's a lot of other things you can do as well. You need to, of course, gather together those potions you need to get wands to chase away clouds that are impeding your progress as you move your different witches through different types of countrysides. There's a lot of other variants as well. Let me go ahead and give you a brief look at how the game is played together with the variants. Then we're going to come back and I'll let you know if it's actually worthy of a Kenner Spiel nomination or win. Okay, this is a typical setup for Broom Service. Now, this board is double-sided, and there are a bunch of other tokens that have to do with variants you can play with in the game. I'm going to explain all of that after I get done with the normal rules. Also, over here off to the side, I'm going to explain this during the course of the normal rules, but these are Bewitched cards, and you are not going to play with these if you have a full complement of five players. Anything less than five, in other words, two through four, you will play with these. I'll explain that in a minute. Now the goal of Broom Service is to have the most victory points at the end of the game. The end of the game is after seven rounds. The way that you keep track of that is through event cards. There's a whole bunch of event cards. You're going to shuffle those up at the beginning of the game and draw seven of them and put the rest back into the box. And at the start of every round, you're going to flip over one of those event cards. And in that way, you can keep track of how many rounds of play. And also the event card will have an effect on gameplay. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, now each player is going to take a set of action cards of their color. All the action cards are exactly the same. They're are 10 cards in total and then every player is going to take one of each kind of potion uh, i know it's kind of hard to tell on my wooden table actually but that's purple you have purple green and orange other than that it's just color matching it doesn't there's no other special effects uh, associated with them and if you are uh, the first and or the last player of the game you decide who's going to go first and then that player and the player to their right is actually only going to get one of these wands this is another these collectively are called resources by the way but you only get one wand resource if you're the first or last player everybody else is going to get two that's because there's a distinct advantage of being first or last in each round which we will get to each player also has two witch pawns they're going to put whoops i just dropped the green witch they're going to put one of those in the uh, one of the castles areas, uh, and one of them in the other castle areas. So each player is going to have two total pawns out on the board. There we go. And then finally, the last little bit of setup that you're going to do, aside from just stacking things along the sides of the board, is you're going to populate the board in every single cloud, uh, cloud space. Cloud space, that'd be funny. Every uh, cloud space on the board, you're going to put one of these randomized cloud tokens. So there should be 18 total. There are more than that, but they're randomized. You just put the rest back into the box. Um, each of these has a symbol showing how many wands you have to use to some in a way, and also how many lightning bolts you get for it. We'll, we'll, we'll get to all that. So here's how the basic framework of each round is going to go. Like I said before, you're going to flip over the top event card. And every event card is going to have some sort of drastic effect on the game. We'll get back to those in a minute because it's not going to make any sense until I explain the rest of the game. Um, but once you've flipped over the event card, every player is going to simultaneously look at their deck of 10 cards. Remember, everyone has the exact same 10 action cards. They're going to set aside four of those cards without showing anyone. Then uh, they'll, they'll lock in the four cards that they're choosing for the round, set aside the other six. Once everyone has made their decision, then starting with the first player, the first player is going to pick one of the four cards from their hand, and they are going to play it and declare what they are using. Now, here's where things get interesting. Each card, and um, I'll explain more in depth about what all these do in a minute, but 
Each card is broken down into a top half and a bottom half for their abilities. The top part is the Brave, and it'll say, I am the Brave blank, in this case, Herb Gatherer. The bottom part will say, I am a Cowardly blank, in this case, Herb Gatherer. Uh, the top part is always better, so in this case, the Brave Herb Gatherer gets two green potions and a wand, whereas the Cowardly Herb Gatherer only gets one green potion. You are going to declare, with the card that you play, which side you're using. So if I'm first and I'm leading off, I'm going to say... I am a brave herb gatherer. Let's say I'm a brave herb gatherer. And why not? Why wouldn't you want to be a brave herb gatherer? You're going to get more stuff, right? Well, here's where the catch comes in. Every player is going to be doing, uh, have the same, uh, are going to have a hand of cards as well of four cards. Now, you don't know if they chose the same cards as you chose for the round. But if they did, starting in clockwise order, each player is either going to say pass, which means they don't have the card in their hand, Or they're going to say, oh wait, I have an herb gatherer as well. At which point, they have two options. One is that they can say, well, I'll just be a cowardly herb gatherer. And if you're a cowardly herb gatherer, you're going to immediately do the cowardly action for any of the cards. If you're cowardly, you do that right away. So in this case, you take a green potion. And in fact, if I was leading off, I could have chosen to done that too. I could say, well, you know what, I'm not going to be brave. I'm just going to be cowardly. And then I would immediately take it. But no matter what, whether the first player or any subsequent player chose cowardly or not, every other player still has to declare whether or not they have the same card in hand. And if they do, they also have to make that choice, whether they be brave or cowardly. The catch to that is, if you declare that you're brave, but then someone else in turn order, remember the game goes up to five players potentially, if someone else in turn order after you declares that they are indeed the brave herb gatherer, not you, they cancel out your action. So this is the risk reward of the game. You can declare that you're brave and try to get more stuff, whether whatever that might be for whatever individual action card that you're playing, but there is a very good chance that someone else, if you're not last, is going to also declare that they're brave and cancel out your action. And it gets less risky for every player to the point where it gets down to the last player in a round and that player can just say whatever they want. Now, the only reason, if you're the last player, you might actually want to say cowardly. The reason for that is because whoever is the last brave player from the previous go-around of playing action cards, that player leads off the next hand. And as you can already tell, there can be a distinct advantage in going further back in the, the play because you can see what everyone else plays and then react to that rather than leading off and having to make the hard choice of whether to be brave or cowardly. But just to sum up, If you're brave and it makes it all the way around, you get all of your good stuff after everyone's had a chance to follow you with the same card. If you were cowardly, you get your stuff right away and you are completely safe. But if you were brave and someone else did have the same card and decided to be brave as well, they cancel out your action and you do nothing. If you don't have the same card that someone led with, you just sit out. You don't do anything. Uh, Which means that people can have uneven hands of cards. One person, it may get to the end of a round and everyone else has played their card except for one player who has like two or three cards left in hand. That's just the way that some rounds can go. Once everyone has played all four of their cards, that's going to signal the end of the round. And by the way, when you choose to play a card, you can just say, I'm not going to do the action. That's completely up to you. Now, the Bewitched cards are an interesting thing. The Bewitched cards, like I said, are any... Uh, with less than five players, you're going to take an extra deck of those action cards that are not in use, and you're going to flip over a certain amount of them depending on the amount of players. And that will change every round. Uh, Those cards are penalty cards. If anyone who is in the game decides to use those particular cards, so in this case it's a Peak Druid and a, uh, a Fruit Gatherer, if anyone plays those cards, they take a negative three victory points. Um, so it can, you can still do it, you can still do all the same effects, but it's a penalty for you. But in any case, once everyone's used their cards, you everyone collects all their cards back in their hand, all 10 of their cards for the next round, and then you flip over the next event card, resolving the event card if you still hadn't done that already, and then you do it all over again, and you do that a total of seven times. Now, what does that actually mean? Like, what are all of these different cards? Well, let me go ahead and run through each of the different cards. So the first card that I'm going to, the first type of card that I will go ahead and explain, let me go ahead and put all these back in a certain order. I'll explain the witch's cards. There are four different types of witch cards. There's a prairie witch, a hill witch, a forest witch, and a mountain witch. They all function exactly the same, both their top and their bottom parts, but for different types of terrain 
out on the map. If I play a prairie witch and I decide to be a brave fairy witch and I actually am able to be a brave fairy witch, I get to move one of my witch pawns onto an adjacent uh, prairie space, the light yellow spaces, and then immediately deliver a potion. If I chose to be a cowardly prairie witch, all I get to do is move. I don't get to deliver a potion. So, and it's going to be the same thing for each of those. If it's a mountain witch, I move onto an adjacent mountain space. If it's a forest witch, I move onto an adjacent forest space, and so on and so forth. Now, let's take a closer look here. You can see the different distinct types of um, uh, terrain. Now, let's say that I was the hill witch, and I move on to one of these hilly areas here, and I got to do the brave part. See how there's these little castles scattered around the map? These areas will t these castles or parapets, or whatever you want to call them, towers. We'll just call them towers. That's what they're supposed to be called. Uh, <laughs> those will tell you what type of potions you can drop off there, whether it's purple, orange, or um, green. Uh, now, if they're circular towers that are this lighter color, they can only accept one potion delivery. So, if I was here on the prairie and I dropped in, a, let's say, well, let's say I moved to the hill area with my blue pawn. I could drop off a purple potion on this tower and I actually leave it out there showing that that is now blocked off. Someone else cannot come by and drop off another purple potion. I get the amount of points listed there, which in this case is three, and this one also happens to give me a wand if I successfully do that as well. Now the square dark gray towers are a little bit different. Those also give me victory points if I drop off potions, but those uh, are free and clear once someone's dropped off. So if I drop off a green potion in this square tower, I get the points and it immediately goes back into the stock, meaning that someone else can come and drop some off there. So that's an unlimited use tower, in other words. Now there's one restriction on movement and those are the clouds. There are a bunch of clouds seated all over the board and when they're out in the water like this, it doesn't really matter because you can't travel there anyways. But if you wanted to travel into this mountain area per se, uh, per se, you have to get rid of this cloud first, otherwise you can't move into it. And I'll get into how you can get rid of those when we get into the rest of the cards that you can play. So those are what the witches do. You can move, and if you're brave, possibly drop off a potion with the same action, which is the most efficient thing to do. Then you've already seen one of these types of cards, which is the herb gatherer. The gatherer cards are what lets you get more potions and potentially wands. The herb gatherer gets you two green and a wand if you're brave, but only one green if you're cowardly. The fruit gatherer gets you two purples in any color of your choice if you're brave, or just one purple. And the root gatherer gets you two wands and an orange, or your choice of a wand or an orange if you're cowardly. Uh, those are all very simple and basic. Now the Peak Druid and the Valley Druid are a little bit unique. Let's say that you're not able to move with the Witches or you don't want to move with the Witch cards, but you also still want to be able to drop off a potion. Well, that's what the Peak Druid and the Valley Druid are for. The Peak Druid corresponds to mountains and hills, and the Valley Druid corresponds to prairies and forests. If you play this card successfully and you're brave, you get to drop off a potion in the applicable type of terrain that you're already in without moving one of your Witch Pawns. And if you're brave, you get an extra three victory points for having done so. If you're cowardly, you still get to drop off and you get whatever points or other rewards you get for dropping off a potion normally, but you don't get the bonus points from the Druid card itself. The last type of action card is the Weather Fairy, and this is where the clouds come into play. If you choose to uh, do the Weather Fairy, uh, so to speak, <clears throat> then you, wherever your pawn is, let's say I was in this adjacent spot here, if you are adjacent to clouds, you can spend a number of wands indicated in the little sunburst on each of the cloud tokens. So this one says one. Return a wand if you're successfully, uh, successfully use the card. Return a wand to the supply, and you get to take this cloud. And at the end of the game, you're going to get an escalating amount of points depending on the number of lightning bolts that you have. This uh, handy chart here, of which there's only one, unfortunately, will tell you how many points you get for how many lightning bolts. You see there's a very escalating amount of points that you can get for that. Um, then, uh, if you are brave with the Weather Fairy, just like with the Druids, you get an extra three points just for having done so, or uh, yeah, three points. Uh, if you're cowardly, you still get to do it, you still get to keep the cloud and spend the wands, but you don't get any bonus points for that. Now let me show you some of the event cards, just a few examples of what you might run across. Um, a lot of them are sort of similar cards, just that affect different things or different types of terrains. Um, you have the Braveheart card here, which says that when this event is played, um, for the rest of the round, the first player of each who plays each roll card, like I call them action cards, they're actually roll cards, I suppose, um, must be brave. You have no choice. And the first player of the round gains an extra magic wand for having done so. Perilous Places. If you have... Uh, 
your witch ponds out on these different types of terrain, so hills, prairies, or forests, you get that many negative points for each witch pond that is stuck on those types of terrains at the end of the round. So you, remember, you flip these over at the beginning, so you have the rest of the round to make sure that doesn't happen. And here's the works. If you have the works, you get to turn in a complete set of resources at the end of the round in order to get nine extra victory points. And so you'll deal with the event cards, some of them good, some of them bad, some of them just neutral depending on your current state in the game. But you're constantly going to be going around, using your roll cards, trying to be brave or cowardly as the situation merits. You get victory points for dropping off potions, for some of the um, uh, extra rewards on some of the roll cards that you have. Um, you get uh, an escalating amount of points depending on how many lightning bolts you've collected from uh, getting clouds. You also get extra bonus points for having complete or semi-complete sets of resources at the end of the game. And that's and you lose victory points if you are playing with less than five players and you use one of the bewitched rolls. But that's essentially it. You're going to keep going around like that till seven rounds have passed. Whoever has the most victory points is the winner of the basic game of Broom Service. Let's talk about a few of the variants. All right, so here's the other side of the Broom Service board. I didn't bother to make it pretty, but uh, you'll notice that it's significantly different than the other side, including the giant letters. Now, what could that possibly mean? Well, let me go through everything. The first and the easiest thing are these extra uh, special clouds. The clouds, uh, these uh, special clouds are going to get mixed into the normal cloud stack and they'll be put out randomly just like everything else and you can use these on either side of the map but they give you different special abilities and bonuses depending on uh, which one it is so this one here says that if you turn in potions adjacent to an area in, in an adjacent area to this cloud you get an extra two points every time that you do so um, and you but you can summon away these clouds just like everything else and claim them for yourself this one says that uh, if you summon away this cloud, you get to drop off a potion with one of your witches for free. This one gives you a free movement with one of your witches if you capture it. This, and there's a couple of different types like this, uh, with each with a different type of potion depicted on it. The way this works is that if you try to summon away this cloud and you have exactly that many potions, or not exactly, I mean you could have more, but if you have at least that many potions of that type of potion, you get an extra bonus of nine victory points, or whatever the case might be. And you don't have to give up those potions, you just have to have them. It's like a threshold that you have to meet. Now, there are also mountain tiles. Uh, these are special mountain tile bonuses. You see here, this one has two wands. This one has a set of potions. This one lets you drop off a potion. This one lets you move your two witches or move one of your witches twice, and so on. How these are going to work is you're actually going to see the, these out on the board. On this side of the board, there's actually spots where you can put these. Um, and every player who's in the game is going to put one of these little talisman symbols down next to each of the mountain symbols, one of their color. Um, if you ever move on to one of those uh, mountainous terrains, not only do you get the reward of the tile, you leave the tile there for other players to also reap the benefits, uh, but you'll claim the reward, then you're going to take your uh, small amulet token off the board. At the end of the game, you're going to get a, a differing amount of points depending on whether you've taken one, two, or three amulets. So it's another sort of point chasing thing you can do. The green tiles, as you might imagine, are forest tiles. You're going to seed the forest with these. And these, when you occupy a forest that has one of these tiles, you're going to take it and put it in front of you, and you can use it on a later turn. And they do different things, like one of them lets you um, take the brave action without any kind of penalty. You can take the brave action even if someone else would cancel you out. It doesn't cancel out anyone else's action. You just get to do it as well. This one lets you play a fifth action uh, or roll card on your turn and so on. Those are the kind of effects you might get, but you'll seed these out into the forest just like you would the mountain tiles. And lastly, you have these hill tiles. And the way the hill tiles work, this has to do with the letters that are on the board. You're gonna seed these out into the appropriate spots on the board and they have a two letter combination like A, B or B, D and A, D and so on. If you move into one of those locations with one of your witch ponds, you get to immediately teleport to one of those two letters. So. If I were to move my witch pawn into the AB, I can immediately teleport to the A or to the B, which is all the way down here. So it's just like an instant teleportation system. And those are all the variants for Broom Service. The core gameplay doesn't change. You're still trying to get as many points as possible. It's just some new extra stuff that you can chase after. Let's get to my final thoughts. All right, well, theme and components. Uh, the theme is maybe uh, not as there as I would have liked it to be. I like the idea of taking control of a bunch of witches who are, well, I guess two witches in particular, 
that's see that's part of the problem that i have with the theme i guess i have two witches who are out on the board moving around and then the cards that i have representing mountain witches forest witches prairie witches and so on are witches that i have helping me out or do i make those witches that i have on the board as pawns into those witches that's kind of the paste it on thing that i i was kind of having an issue with as i played even though I like the idea of the theme quite a lot and dropping off potions and things like that, but it's fine. It, it works for what it is. The game looks really good. The board is a little bit busy, but once you've played it once, everything makes a bit of sense. It can be kind of tough to figure out where towers are. Would be my only like nitpicky complaint there. Uh, but once again, and I feel like a broken record here, this is yet another game. I feel like I've played a lot of these in the last couple months that has artwork from Vincent Dutrait, and it is amazing. I mean, just I love the artwork on the cards. I really, really do. Um, so I can't complain about the appearance of the game based strictly on that. Although I do like the little potion meeples as well. Those are pretty neat. I almost wish they had made uh, wand meeples, or I recommend that if you've ever played the game Morels, at least the original version, the that game you have to gather a bunch of sticks to cook mushrooms, and there's tiny little sticks that come in the game. That would have been perfect as wands in this game. Oh well, they should put me in charge of uh, publishing and getting the game out. Actually, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> moving on to the actual gameplay, and I will remind you once again, I never played the original version of this game, which is Brew. I have no idea what the two have in common. I can only judge this on its own merits. And this is one of the most unique games I have played in quite a while. Now, it's interesting because a lot of the core elements of the game are not innovative or unique at all. From the action selection to um, and, and all of the players either following or or whatnot, and you know, cho choosing actions as well that can be, uh, kind of bang off of each other, um, to the pickup and deliver aspects. I mean, that's really not that unique or different. That felt very samey. But how the actual action selection works and the interaction between the uh, choosing brave and cowardly, that whole dynamic of the game is, I'm not gonna say it's like fantastically wonderful, what it is is interesting in the sense that it gets different reactions from people and your enjoyment of this game is going to be based solely based on whether or not you can stomach that mechanism because it can be both really cool and neat and tense in a good way or very very stressful let me put it another way i have played this game three times now which is not a lot granted but I think it's sort of, in, it's enough to give me a general idea of what I can expect here. I've played it at different player accounts. I have not had a close game of room service. It's always been a blowout. Maybe some of the people in the back have been close to each other, but the person who was in the lead was like at least 20 points ahead. And while I think that with more and more experience, you can close that gap a bit, I think this is the type of game where there will always be a decisive winner because so if someone's doing really well in this game, at least one other person is doing very poorly. That's the very nature of the role selection in this game, where you can choose to be brave, but there is a huge risk there. But you have to risk in order to win big. You do. There are turns where you're like, out of potions, you're like, well, I need potions. And being a cowardly root gatherer is not going to cut it. I need more than that, or this is not going to happen. We have seven rounds of play, and those seven rounds can go by very quickly. So I have to take a risk here, and sometimes it just doesn't work. But I kind of like that tension. I like everything about that. I like how you there's little subtle things like, uh, okay, I'm leading off this turn, but I really do not want to lose my action, so I'll be cowardly. Or maybe you're the last person to pick the role for that round of play, and you're like, oh, great, I can just be brave and get everything that I want. But then I have to be brave. I have to go first next time we choose a card. And I don't want that because I have this other card here that I have to make sure that I do, and I want to get the top part. I want to get the brave part. So I'd rather go last next turn, or at least not first. That dynamic is very, very cool to me, while at the same time, you're going to have turns where you've got nothing to do because people canceled your card. And that risk mitigation, ah, it's just really, really interesting to me, even if the rest of the game is relatively mundane. You move your witches around, drop off potions, hope to maximize your points, 
as much as possible. The whole thing about getting rid of clouds is neat, and there are some interesting sort of set collection elements here. Trying to get as many resources as possible and trying to get those lightning bolts. Um, I would probably... Some of the variants I'd play with all the time, some of them I wouldn't. Uh, I like the... I, For instance, I'd probably not want to play on the portal side of the board all the time, but I might play with the mountain bits all the time. That That's pretty interesting. As far as player count, I think that's very, very critical in this game. I think it really is meant to be played with five. That's my opinion. I can easily see some people disagreeing with me, but with five, even though you have, you, you could definitely argue less control over what you can get to play in a turn because you have five people in play choosing cards that might have chosen the same cards as you and might have the same game plan as you, and that can be frustrating. Even so, I think it's less interesting and more fiddly to have the Bewitched cards out. And maybe they should have come up with a different solution other than the Bewitched cards instead of like having a word like, okay, I can play that card, but I lose three points. So it becomes even more of a zero-sum game at that point because now I could really open up that gap between the leader and whoever is behind him uh, if I lose even more points. So that can be a bit of a frustrating thing. And again, it's fiddly. It's one more thing you have to worry about in an otherwise pretty simple and straightforward game. So I like it with five. I think that's the best. Definitely don't play it with two. That was not a good experience for me. But the more the merrier. Uh, I like it. It is really interesting and neat. It can be frustrating. It's, again, whether or not you like that system of either winning big or not is really going to determine whether you can have fun with this game, especially since the theme is kind of light, but it looks good. Um, there's good card play and interactions. The, the you know, the bits are neat and even aside from the card play the pickup and deliver is fine it works well and works smoothly um and uh, is it kenner spiel uh, i mean is it worthy of the kenner spiel i don't know i definitely do this i played now i played all three of them broom service elysium and or or the owns or the owns or leans uh, and it's definitely the lightest of the three um not by much i'd say elysium is not all that complicated or or the owns is by far the more complicated of the three, if that's what you want to use as a judge for whether or not um, it should be nominated for the award at all. I don't think it's personally my favorite. I would say it's probably number three. I think it's for me it's Elysium or Leons, although I need to play that again, and uh, Broom Service, but it's still good. And if it were to win, I wouldn't be upset about it because it's a solid, fascinating game. That is Broom Service from Ravensburger. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.